What is going on, everyone? Chris with Journos Comics and Pop Culture. Thank you guys for tuning in today. We got a sweet, sweet video talking about comic book investing. And I'm going over some basic tips to turn you into a collecting pro. Now, obviously, collecting pros can be of all different sorts, but we are going to focus on some awesome investing tips today, guys. Before we get into it, a few things. First and foremost, of course, if you aren't subscribed to the channel, please take some time to do so and check out all the awesome links below, including how you can support the channel by being a patron via patreon.com and only $3.99 a month to get extra perks, exclusive Patreon-only perks, and as well as entry into all my Patreon contests. Uh, you can also check out Official Journals Comics merch link below. Also, our comic book canon YouTube link. Go sub us over there where we have our live shows every Friday. Now, with that being said, guys, we're going to head into getting into this video and I want to mention a quote before we dive into it. Collect what you're passionate about. Chris McDaniel, OMG Chris, rest in peace. I put this quote on this video because I'm going to tell you all. Before Chris passed, when I was really new into my channel, I did my first like how to invest in comics video. And Chris was the first one to comment on that video. And he said, Chris, Chris to Chris, right? He said, you found your niche, brother. This is it. And his words have stuck with me and I've watched my channel grow and I know he's been looking down and I just had to, uh, you, you know, really dedicate this video to him. But without further ado, guys, let's get in to the video. All right. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk about this with you guys today. We are going to be discussing four basic finance terms. All right. Now, before I review those terms that you see on screen, here's the thing. I, I talk about these terms constantly and I get people in the comments saying, oh man, you know, I, I appreciated you talking about this. It's the first time I heard something like this. Like, can you break this down more like this? So I said, why don't we do a video and just consolidate it all so we could get kind of a clear, uh, really to the bones approach on, I think the four factors that is really going to help all you guys be kind of pro collectors that, that want to really engage in that investing and financing aspect of the hobby. With that being said, let's look at those four key elements. FMV, this is probably the one that most of us know about, fair market value. We're going to be talking about that. ROI, return on investment. This one's decently simple, but still, some of you might not know, and that's okay. Third, risk versus reward, also known as risk versus return same thing and lastly ror rate of return that's the last one we're going to be talking about today so let's get in to uh understanding fair market value guys okay check this out i as much as i say this is probably the, the one term out of all these that more of the majority of collectors tend to use and understand fair market value but i think a lot of people still have a misconception of the term and what it means. So let's look at this chart here, guys. You have two circles here that really uh, tie in to create fair market value. You have hypothetical willing buyers and you have hypothetical willing sellers. Now, what is fair market value? Well, it's when those two meet in the middle, guys. All right. So if we look to the left, both parties are able and willing to trade. Obviously, this trade being a barter system of uh, cash, <laughs> you know, we're looking at uh, cash uh, value uh, in this hypothetical, uh, both fully reasonably informed, which means mostly, you know, they're, they're making an, a conscious autonomous decision. Um, both have financial capacity. They have the, uh, the capital to make that happen, whether the seller has the, the product and the buyer has the funds, right? And then lastly, neither acting under compulsion, meaning nobody's putting a gun to your head. And this is what we hear so much. I'm tired of variance and, 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 you know, I'm being forced to do this or forced to collect that. Nobody is putting a gun to your head or putting you under hypnosis to, to, to put you under compulsion to make these decisions. We're making autonomous decisions here. This is what creates fair market values, guys. All right. <laughs> so, um, that those are the, the, the four key elements to take in. Now, how does that relate in the comic book world and in the comic book industry, right? So you look at something like this, guys, and you have take looking at Amazing Spider-Man 55. This book it's selling for $36 plus shipping. 
$29.99 plus shipping. There's a $35 one, best offer accepted. So, okay, well, well how, do you, it, how do you gauge a fair market value then? I mean, we're looking at this and it seems the fair market value is somewhere around $30. Um, this is a small sample size, but so how do you really gauge fair market value for a comic book? Well, that precedes us to, to, to the next image here, and we're going to break this down. Who decides the fair market value of a comic book? Let's read along. Since the comic book market is unlike any other primary goods market, fair market value is, a, is determined by the short-term fluctuating average of sales values on the secondary market. Let's repeat that. Since the comic book market is unlike any other primary goods market, fair market value is determined by the short-term fluctuating average of sales values on the secondary market. So let me break this down, guys. Fair market value for a specific comic book can change quickly. It fluctuates within the short term often. So the best thing, and this is what I always tell people when they're doing fair market values, and you know, you could go on GoCollect, you could go on um, Cover Price, you can even go on, you know, Key Collect, you can go on all these databases, right? And most of them say fair market value, and they give you this number, but most likely that number is skewed in some way, because a lot of them take data from years back and implement it into a current fair market value that's outdated, right? That doesn't uh, necessarily work. So what I always recommend to do is take a sample size. So let's go back to looking at Amazing Spider-Man 55. Would you take a, a, a sample size of books being sold that sold maybe like the day of or the week that it came out when these books were still selling for maybe 5 to $10? No, because that's outdated. So I really would, for especially for a new book like this, this is what I would do. I would take the last week. I would take maybe anywhere from the last five to 10 days and look at what it's selling for. I would calculate all those sales, add them all up, and then divide them by amount sold. And that's your fair market value average. Because remember, guys, fair market value is simply an average. It's an average of the sales on the census, on the market, and it gives you this rough estimate of what the value for that book is. So, and the reason why it's so different with comic books is because when you gauge what a hypothetical buyer is willing to pay and a hypothetical seller is willing to pay, say, for um, mo a modern electronics, say, a modern 52-inch Samsung TV, Company, companies in, in electronics, like Samsung, and you know your retailers, they're going to run a whole bunch of algorithms and they're going to, I'm not even going to get into all that, but there's a lot more process that go, goes into it to where they estimate what a fair market value is. This fair market value overlaps is what we call market equilibrium. Market equilibrium is when the price is set to where the company selling the product can maximize their sales and profits while setting the price as high as it can be with the, the potential buyer still willing to pay that price. Which means if a, a, the value of a product is not at market equilibrium, all right, they're going to do either two things. If it's too high, the buyers aren't going to buy it, right? And they're going to lose money. If the price is marked too low, then your potential buyers are going to flock to it and the sellers are going to be losing money because you didn't balance out supply and demand. Now, before I complicate things even further, let's just end this on this, guys, when we talk about fair market value. Fair market value for comic books can change and fluctuate in the short term. Always get a, um, a, a current sample size of your data Add up all your sales, divide it by amount sold, and that's how you can gauge your fair market value. Uh, but be smart. Be smart because it's not always going to be 100% accurate. All right, moving on, guys. We are going to go to our next term, which is ROI, return on investment. And we're looking at how to calculate return on investment, guys. This is pretty basic. Your return on your, your investment is, is basically... Uh, you know, your, your, your profit after costs, all right? 
So you take your, your net profit, you divide it over your cost of your investment, right? That is your return on investment, all right? That is your ROI. So let's look at this right here. We look at two, uh, uh, you know, hypothetical situations when we look at comic books. We have a Wolverine number one and a 9.6. Say your purchase price was 60 bucks. Say current fair market value is $150 and you sell that book for $150. Your return on investment is $90 in dollar amount because that's your profit. But your return on investment in percentage, which is this equation, is 150%. So you basically took a return of 150% of your original purchase price. That's your return on investment. That's solid, right? Let's look at another uh, example, though. Spider Woman number one, 6.0. You buy it for 50 bucks. Current fair market value is lower than your purchase price at $35. Your return on investment in dollars, you took a loss of $15. So now your ROI and percentage is negative 30%. So return on investment isn't always a positive number. Now, you may ask, why is there ROR right next to it? And I'm going to explain that to you because rate, of, rate return on investment and rate of return are uh, basically uh, tied at the hip. All right? But we're going to look into rate of return in a moment here, okay? But first, we're going to look at how do you want to gauge a return on investment, all right? What type of return on investment are you looking for? And in order to do that, you have to understand risk versus reward. Or as it says here in the, in the top left chart, risk versus return. All right, so this is our third talking point today. Risk versus return are uh, correlated always. All right, they're, they're in a symbiotic relationship with each other when we talk about investments. All right, and anytime you make an investment and you're looking for a return, there is going to be risk involved, all right? So when you look at the, the chart over here and you see the squares, all right, how a normal market or what we would call an efficient market usually works, the more risk, you, you usually get into that top right corner and that's why you see uh, kind of the, the line chart move in that direction. The more it goes to the right, the higher it goes up. You have ebb and flow in there. That's why it's up and down, up and down like uh, some, some uh, hilltops, right? Ebb and flow, but ultimately, the more risk you take, the more possible return you have. So if you look down more to the left, the less risk that you're willing to take, the less return you're going to receive. So that's why if you're looking at the stock market, if you want to get into conservative investments, you might not see as much return, but you're not taking as much risk and you may be okay with that. But you may be a gambler and you may be say, you know, I'm putting money down and I want, I want something moderate and I want something risky. So I'm willing to get, I'm willing to take all that risk because I'm hoping I'm betting on that high return. So let's look at the image on the right, guys. This line basically showcases that. This line shows where, and it's the line's called the efficient frontier. It means any type of investor can sit anywhere along, anywhere along this efficient frontier. I'm not going to get into all the rest of it. That just, you, you know, you could put a dot on anywhere of this efficient frontier line, and that can be you. If you're willing to take high risk for more return, you're going to be at the top right of that line. If you're willing to take less risk and just want to be conservative and have a small amount of return, you're going to be closer to that lower line towards the left. Now, let's read what it says here. An efficient frontier measures the amount of risk and the desired return an investor sets for themselves. Now, let's talk about how it pertains to comics. Unlike the stock market, comic books do not exist in an efficient market and are more volatile of an investment, meaning... High risk doesn't always equal high, high return. Now, high risk doesn't always equal high, uh, a possibility of, of high return in any market. 
But comic books are more volatile because we don't really necessarily invest in comic books like people invest in the stock market. Usually, when you look at an efficient frontier, you look at a portfolio where I think comic collectors, they look at like individual books. But really, your whole collection is actually more like a stock portfolio. And it is similar in this way. Because when I say volatile, guys, I don't mean, oh, that means the comic book industry is hurting and it's not a solid investment. That's not what I mean. It's just, it's a bit more sporadic because of each book that you invest in being completely different than the next. But the similarities are this. Say I have a Bronze Age book that I find for $5. Maybe it's an early appearance of Rogue. That's, I'm taking, I'm low on the scale on the official frontier in risk because I'm not putting a lot of money in it. And my, you know, uh, expected return is going to be low because I don't think it's going to be a huge book, but it could increase in value over time. So that could be seen as a conservative investment. Whereas, um, you know, you could spend $1,000 on an on a Ultimate Fallout 4 and be high up on the efficient frontier line because you're taking a lot of risk. And, you know, that book is one that has the potential for a higher return. But let me, let me explain how it's a bit different than the stock market here. If you invest $1,000 in an Amazing Spider-Man 129, that book is probably less volatile than your UF4, at least right now in the market. And it, even though you're putting a lot of more money out, it is more of a conservative investment because it's more of what we call blue chip key that has been stable on the market for a long time and we are confident in its long-term growth. So those are just some simple examples. All right, we're gonna move on here, guys. And we're going to look at rate of return. So this is the last thing that we're going to talk about today. And I think rate of return is very important because rate of return really analyzes the rate of growth or the rate of loss over time. Now, your rate of return, you really want to calculate it based on periods. So you, And that's why when we were talking about return on investment, Basically, your return on investment percentage is the same thing as your re, uh, rate of return for one period. But a return on investment really is one percentage over the time you bought it and whenever you sold it or whenever you're thinking about selling it hypothetically. Rate of return is monitoring what it's doing period to period to period. So rate of return equals your current value minus the original value over the original value, all right? So it's your percent increase or your percent decrease of value. Think of ROR as your percent of growth slash loss. And that's what I was just saying, which is the same as your return on investment as a percentage. But remember, rate of return is something you want to calculate either, say, month after month or quarter after quarter or year after year, right? So let's look at this, for example. Let's say that this is a, a book that you bought, right? Say this is um, Uncanny X-Men 266, the first appearance of Gambit, and you paid 100 bucks for it, right? And in January of last year, it lost about 3% in its value. So after, oh, well, actually, this is, yeah, so we're doing this by month, guys. So at the end of January, you calculated all the sales on the market and you, you know, added up all the sales, divided it by the amount of sales, and you got an average current fair market value at the end of January, all right? And say that fair market value is 3% less than what you paid for it. So your rate of return at that point would be a negative rate of return. It would be a loss. But then February, you take the fair market value at the end of January, and at the end of February, you take that current fair market value and say it increased 3%. So now for that period, you have a positive rate of return. And then in March, you do the same thing. You take the fair market value at the end of February and the fair market value at the end of March. You figure out the difference. 
and divide that by the beginning fair market value, and that's your rate of return for March. And then that says, oh, it, that was a 7% increase. So then you do this for a whole year, right? And you then you calculate all those as an average. That would equal in a year-long average rate of return. So I know this is a lot, guys. I hope you're taking notes. But I'm going to tell you guys, this is very, very important for anyone that looks at comic books as an investment. And I think really, look, if you talk about a rate of return, you really want to look at this in periods because everything is ebb and flow. I'm going to tell you right now, if you took a, if each one of these was a rate of return for each month and you added them all up, added each percentage up and divided them by 12, your rate of return uh, for the year would be positive, right? So this is how you would like calculate long-term growth, right? Ebb and flow is normal. And I guarantee you, your fair market value at the end of December was more than it was at the beginning of January. So then you're not just looking at the red. Oh no, it dipped in July and August and September. Oh, I better sell this. I better get it off my hands. Um, this is bad. No, that's normal ebb and flow in any market. Look at long-term. And then if you hold a book for five years, instead of doing month by month, you do year by year rate of return, right? Guys, I really, really uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video today. Like I said, hey, all this finance stuff, even when it pertains to comic books, it's a lot to take in. Um, I actually think that, you know, I, I stuck to the four key talking points today. I might even break these talking points down and do a video on each. So I'll do four separate videos to where I'll even dive in more in detail on each piece, all right? And I hope that that can even help you guys even more in the further. So again, I really appreciate you all for joining me today. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. I would be happy to continue this conversation with you all. I wanna make sure that all of you are uh, being the best collectors that you can be, enjoying the hobby, and if I can uh, help provide my knowledge and help you uh, gain tools for the trade. Hey, that's what I'm here for. So drop your comments below, guys. And again, if you aren't subscribed to the channel, please, please take some time to do so. That being said, again, thank you all for watching. Thank you all for being here. Be well. And until next time.